Hi everybody, um, I'm a software engineer at Etsy um, and in my masters I did a lot of functional programming in Haskell. I wrote a type checker for a compiler for a domain specific language for a dynamic programming problem. So that's quite different. And Haskell was also my first programming language, so I might be a bit unconventional. Um, I still find functional programming amazing and all the power that it has and that's why I want to talk about it today, but the tool to work with will be JavaScript. So together with my friends, I started to think about how to make functional programming more accessible because it's so powerful. And for this, it's great to start with a language that's familiar, so we can focus just on the concepts. And since no, new concepts can be difficult, we will use cooking analogies to make things more understandable and learn about curry cooking along the way. It's a very good example because it's very algorithmic and everybody has to eat. So cooking a curry would start with frying spices in a pan. But wait, <laughs> let's talk about programming. Delicious programming. Programming is awesome. I love programming. But also, it's sometimes hard. It's hard when the code is too complex. So in reality, it looks a bit more like this. Um, we could say each problem brings its own complexity, and it's our job as programmers to build a program to solve it. When we start, we're creating some kind of mental workspace. Um, but over time, things can get messy. So we add unnecessary complexity to the problem. We add things that are just there for historical reasons and not because of the problem. That's not ideal. So let's create a workspace for a curry recipe. It could look like this. Um, we need some spices, a base for the sauce, because curry or originally it comes from the word sauce, and we need a main ingredient, which could be some of this. That's a lot of ingredients, wow. Let's say we pick five spices, one base for the sauce, and one main ingredient for our recipe. That's already way more combinations than I can easily oversee. I don't know about you. So in functional programming and in cooking, we like to decompose our problems into smaller sub-problems so that we can leverage the power of combinations of solutions instead of drowning in combinations of problems. Oh my god. So uh, here you can see I have a function shuffle, which shuffles an array of stuff. Um, I didn't write it out, it's too long, but you can imagine. Um, and then I have this function pick, which picks from a shuffled array. And last, then I have this function print item, which just prints a thing with an asterisk in front of it. So then I can do something like pick five spices and map the print item function over them, which looks pretty readable. So for our comp composed recipe function, I would say it's really human readable. Uh, we pick from each ingredient group and we print the resulting recipe with a bit of words around it. So what did we just do? We just used two really good ideas to keep our workspace clean. First of all, having a good set of basic functions that we can compose and combine to achieve something more complex. Also, it should be clear whether the order of steps is important or not. If it's not important, it should be up to us. So we would have them as independent functions. And then the second thing was uh, capturing all side effects in our recipe to avoid surprises. So when I put the right ingredients into a recipe, I should always be re rewarded with the correct result or the same delicious dish. So no secret side effects, no. <laughs> if the temperature of the ingredients isn't specified, it shouldn't affect the result if I change it. Secret side effects forbidden, we don't want them. No leaving of the recipe. So if we program in this way, we can often grasp what a function does by just looking at its input and output, and that's all we need to know. Okay, let's really get started. Let's talk about abstraction. Some famous person in computer science once said, the art of programming is the art of organizing complexity, of mastering multitude and avoiding its bastard chaos. <laughs> I really like that quote. Um, and then he also said, we all know that the only mental tool by means of which a very finite piece of reasoning can cover a myriad of cases is called abstraction. Isn't that great? <laughs> so what does he actually mean? In code, we make decisions all the time in order to solve our problem. And as a consequence, many pro uh, programs are combinations of all these decisions, right? So we're creating a huge space of possible paths through the program and through the states of our workspace. 
And we're supposed to keep all these states in our head. <laughs> and if we forget about one, we create unexpected behavior, ranging from a small bug to a gaping security hole. <laughs> our only tool for keeping this combinatorial complexity at bay and weed out unnecessary complexity is abstraction. So how can we use it? The good news is we already use it. <laughs> Functional programming heavily builds on abstractions we know already. Let's go through them real quick. So the basis of programming is often so simple that we forget about it, but we all know it. It's abstracting from a value. So it would look like this. By assigning it to a variable, I can give it a name. And I can use it later by just calling that name. I don't have to write all these veggies there. And in the functional programming world, I don't make a big difference between a value and a function when I name them. Um, we can also assign a function to a variable. We say functions are first-class citizens. You've heard that before. Um, but wait, we didn't talk about functions yet. So building on this, what's the next more abstract building block of a program? Statements and blocks of statements. To abstract from a block and give it a name, we would create a function. And function abstraction is everywhere. It's a bit undervalued as the main means of code organization. I really love it. It's at the core of functional programming. That's why it's called like that, right? So we could say we build toolboxes of functions, assign them to variables, we pass them to other functions, and we combine them. Wait, I just said we pass functions to other functions? So functions that receive other functions as arguments are called higher order functions. And they are the next level of abstract, abstraction, abstracting from func function abstractions. So I'm passing another function into my sort function here, sorting my spices. And by passing a function as an argument, I can supply a part of the behavior. We could say we are configuring the behavior of the higher order function. This technique is not possible in all programming languages, but in JavaScript, higher order functions are more common, such as map and reduce, which we know on arrays, and also all these functions that accept callbacks for asynchronous JavaScript. And on the top level of our hierarchy in our usual program, we have sets of functions. The functions are the tools in our toolbox. They are really important. So abstraction gives us levels of detail to structure our programs, and on each level, we get contained building blocks. We didn't talk about data yet, but that's okay, because we're learning to think in terms of functions first. Okay. Functions, functions, functions. Mm, wait, with all these levels of abstraction, don't I just have a tree-like composition for a program, like in any imperative programming style? How is it different? Don't I have something like a program and then, or a module and then functions, blocks, statements down to variable declarations? Uh, yeah, that's right. And that's why it was possible for me to move around between functional and imperative world in my master's thesis. That's why I could take a program that was expressed in recurrences, that means recursive functions that are evaluated like in mathematics, and I could translate it into programs that fill tables in an efficient way and in a smart order using loops. Both paradigms focus on very different areas, though. Let's have a look. So every time I write a loop statement, I would need a variable to evaluate whether it's time to leave the loop. If we had no state, we would have to use a recursive function instead. So it would look a bit more like this. We would focus more on functions than on statements. And the cool thing is that a function is a complete little package of abstraction that captures a behavior. So we can always swap it out for another one to get a different behavior. And a lot of magic is also the stuff we can do with functions to combine them and leverage their power. With special higher order functions, and that's why I also made the higher order functions big. Okay, let's be honest, isn't this slow? I would say watch your inner loops and performance as you always should, but considering this, we are optimizing for some other time than computation time. We're optimizing for developer time. By keeping the code elegant, we can keep it maintainable because we can find stuff faster and we can reuse it and recombine functionality. It's more fun to cook with a well-kept food pantry stocked with our functions. So um, why do I talk about curry all the time? Wouldn't it be great if we could start computing even before we have all our stuff ready? 
Let's talk about currying and partial application. I still have to eat more from the knowledge tree. This is a curry tree. On our lucky day, we might find its leaves in a curry spice mixture. Usually, it's not in there. <laughs> and this is Haskell Curry. He ate so much from the knowledge tree of combinatorial logic that he has his own function, the curry function, and he has programming languages named after his first and last name. In the literature and in theory and in Haskell, which is almost the same thing, <laughs> currying is the transformation of a function with n arguments into n functions with one argument each. So let's have a look. Here we see a function with three arguments, a, b, c. It just prints them. The curried version consists of a function, returning a function, returning a function. And each one of these has just one argument and returns a function that expe uh, expects the remaining arguments. The difference is visible in the call of the normal and the curried version. You already see it here, but let's look in detail. So um, the function would look like this. The curried function would look like this. I can supply the parameters a, b, c one by one. So I can give Haskell b curry. But in the same way, I could also prefill my arguments into a function up to a specific depth. So I could just supply the Haskell, and then I would have a function which names everybody Haskell. <laughs> um, so I could specialize a more general function, if that makes sense. Let's also revisit higher order functions real quick. They can help us to do repeated work on data structures. Map, reduce, and filter are some of the most prominent higher order functions. In JavaScript, we know them from arrays. So map applies a supplied unary function with one argument um, to each array element. How does it work? We already used it. Uh, we said uh, pick three spices and then map the print item function over them. Um, so on the left, we have our, our array of the three spices. And then on the right side, uh, we have the result. How does this work? It works like this. Um, just for each array element, the print item function is executed. And we get this result. So it's like a transformation of the array. And reduce combines an array of elements into a single result value via repeated application of a supplied binary function. So the binary function gets two inputs, produces one output, so we're reducing something. Let's look at an example. Um, here we want to sum up all our items in our food pantry. So uh, the individual counts you can see here. Remember, we had uh, 10 spices, three soup bases, and five main ingredients. Um, and plus is a binary function. I just rewrote it here because the operator works a bit differently. And we apply it repeatedly when we make a sum. So this is clearly a pattern for reduce and would look like this. So I do 10 plus 3, get 13 plus 5, and I get my overall result of 18. So it's reduced to one number. Um, and filter filters the elements of an array based on a predicate. So how would that work? Um, let's say we have an array of veggies and we want to filter for what's in stock so we can start cooking. We filter for a quantity greater zero, you can see there. Um, so how does it work? I have 25 okra, so is it in stock? It still is in the resulting array, but the carrots get filtered out because I have zero in stock. So we saw... Um, Closures, currying, and as we have learned, partial application and higher order functions help us to build complex, specialized functions from more simple um, and more uh, uh, from simple and more general functions. All right, let's build some pipelines. Function composition. Um, a function transforms input into output, as we said in the beginning, and the most straightforward way to build functions from other functions is to just connect them into a pipeline would look like this, function composition. Uh, we can write ourselves a higher order function for function composition. And it looks like the definition from a math book. So you see the g of f of x in there. And with these tools, we're now ready to build us some functions. Let's try it out. So um, here I count the pieces of okra and chop them in half. Remember, we had 25 pieces of okra. And I'm just chopping them in half, so I get double the amount of okra. <laughs> so I can compose the two, and then I get 50 okra. <laughs> um, and um, 
so we can see from this combination we were building something new. And this style of programming can bring our programs closer to the declarative style, in which we just tell the computer what to do, but not how to compute it step by step. And programs in the declarative style are usually easier to read, because we don't have to keep the state of the workspace in our head at all times. So I have to make a confession now. <laughs> um, I'm coming from Haskell, and some things are a bit different there. I'm just going to tell you for context. So in Haskell, we have referential transparency. A function can be replaced with its value. It means the same thing. And this is mind-boggling coming from JavaScript, because there's no such thing as call or return in Haskell. Um, we have to think about functions in the sense of mathematics, where I can, f of, if I have f of x equals y, I can replace the left-hand side, f of x, with the right-hand side, y, and vice versa, without worrying if the function was called and if the result's ready yet. And this simplifies reasoning about the program for both the, the programmer and the computer. Also, Haskell is lazy, so it only computes values when they are needed, and it has automatic currying, so it's perfectly normal to just partially supply functions arguments there. And Haskell is also purely functional. That means we cannot have side effects that modify our environment in a Haskell program. Even if we wanted to, we would have to use an explicit mechanism to perform side effects. So that's a bit different. Wow, <laughs> we already tricked ourselves deep into functional programming. Um, we could say if you understand the importance of functions and what, what we can do with them, you understand functional programming. What we can do with them was pass them to other functions, currying, composition, but what else is there? Is there more? Um, a question that comes with statelessness uh, when we try to avoid side effects is the question of how to control our program flow. Usually we need a counter for our iterations, and then we need a variable to check if it's time to leave the loop, right? But this variable is usually not reflected in our input and output of the function. So it's a side effect. We want to avoid it. It's bad. Um, in pure functional programming, we would have to change our way of thinking exactly for this reason. Instead of iterating, we would favor recursion. And that means we use a function that calls itself for a smaller part of the problem. That sounds uncomfortable. <laughs> What's so bad about the loop? In fact, nothing's bad about the loop. It's just a different way of thinking about the problem. Iteration is usually bottom up, whereas recursion solves it top down. And I'm very grateful that I had to move back and forth between these two words in my master's thesis, because it's a really good brain exercise. Restrictions to just functions made people construct really cool stuff like the Y combinator, showing that recursion is possible with just functions and parameters. You don't even need declarations. And I think that's one of the coolest things in computer science. So if we restrict ourselves to the purely functional style, um, everything is expressed in the input and output of functions, even the program flow. It's a recursion over the input or output of the data. Oops. <laughs> um, when we have to deal with the internet, um, a synchronous code can dramatically reduce the latency in a distributed system. But it can be hard to write. We all know this. Because there's no way in vanilla JavaScript to say, wait for the return of a function, uh, we supply a callback function and tell the function where to continue after it's done. If we have a cascade of callback functions and we need to do error handling, things can get hairy. So uh, this is there's my favorite web, uh, website, callbackhell.com. <laughs> You've all seen this code, which looks like a pyramid and is horrible. Um, so a functional programming technique for explicit error handling would be using monads. Imagine we would be in the purely functional world, where functions behave like mathematical functions. So the order in which we write our functions doesn't matter in this world. But in JavaScript, we can execute expressions in sequence by writing one after the other with a semicolon in between. So it's different. How does that work? How about making our own semicolon? Um, let's observe what it does first. So what does the semicolon do in this function? So here, first, the given string is printed, and then the length of the string is returned. Let's write a function that behaves like this semicolon here. Can we do that? Uh, so we wrap the expressions 
the two expressions that we had that we want to chain, we wrap them into anonymous functions. So we can call them like we want to later on um, when they come into our semicolon function later as arguments. Um, we also need an extra return here so that the last value gets out of this extra function that we wrapped around it again. So that's like a technical step. And then uh, to abstract from the two statements, we can now pass in the first and second expression as arguments into our semicolon function. Now it's also clear why we had to wrap them into anonymous functions because of the different return behavior which we have here. And the expressions depend on each other, but the first result gets thrown away. We can now chain the first and second expression in the same way a semicolon can. So it's producing the same output. In fact, we can chain as many expressions as we like. So I can chain here, this works, like a semicolon, and then bang, which adds an exclamation mark, and then I get my result of 16. This sounds really boring because we already have a semicolon in JavaScript. <laughs> Um, but if you think about this for a while, we just constructed a chaining function from purely functional parts. So this is a big deal. We went from a world in which the order of functions or statements doesn't make a difference to a world in which we can chain statements into a sequence to establish their order. The semicolon function works like a function known as monadic bind. What's that? So monadic bind or mbind resembles function composition but it throws away intermediate results, and statements can be executed just for their side effects. I just replaced the name here, mbind. So we said monads chain things into sequences. What, what kind of things? Let, let's imagine a container, a cooking pot. We start with pot one. So that's my pot one. It has some contents. Um, here is pot one. Um, and when we have the result from pot one, we can execute pot two. So it would look like this and go on like this. Um, so I'm doing some steps here. This is a different view on the semicolon function from above. Steps can be chained with mbind, and after we work through the entire sequence of steps, we get some kind of result inside the pot, the contents. Let's express this workflow in steps to reveal the pattern. If we would just write down the values of the computation, it would look like this, so just the content. Um, so the difference between these two versions is that the first one puts everything in a pot, and the second one works on the naked values. Um, let's now imagine we have a really good reason to put everything into a pot. So for example, we could hide some additional logic in there. The pot could keep track of the sum of all numbers that are stored in it, or it could keep a list of ingredients sorted in the pot. The question is now, can we deduce a generic monad pattern from this? Um, so we want a function that applies a function to the contents inside a pot and gives us a new pot containing the result of that function. We can define this function, which is mbind for the pot monad on the pot prototype. Let's do that. Um, we see a very clear pattern now. We also see that we need an extra step to get the contents out of the pot in the end. So I'm doing the C contents here to get that out. And um, step one of the computation is A equals new pot of one. As an object-oriented programmer, I say, ah, it's a constructor. I'm constructing a new thing of type pot. But in the monad jargon, we call this function unit or return. And return's already taken in JavaScript, so I want to be careful. Um, it takes a value and transforms it into a monadic value. And the next steps, they all have a similar pattern. We've seen it before. We know already it uses the function mbind. And mbind takes a monadic value and a function which works on the contents. We sometimes say the plain non-monadic type and it returns a new monadic value containing the result, just as we intended. And that's all. <laughs> Why are there so many people talking about monads? Why don't we just say pattern that wraps and chains computations? First of all, that's not a very good name, and also it was described by mathematicians from the field of category first. 
So for the practical usage of the monad pattern, this is completely unimportant. We don't need to know about it. But what's really cool about the monad pattern in JavaScript is that we can hide stuff in it. So we get an extra layer of abstraction to hide the bookkeeping and all this error handling, and we can let the beauty of the algorithm shine. So now that we've conquered the monads, do we get dessert? <laughs> I'd rather have you take something home because it's late. Um, I hope you enjoyed some of the techniques and I hope I could make them digestible. And if you ever find yourself in a mess, uh, maybe some of these techniques will help you out of it. And if you never get yourself into one, at least it's fun to reason about them. <laughs> so don't forget to take home some of the purely functional goodness. Abstraction, it's more important than we think. Um, very localized understanding of code and very small functions that you can reuse. Explicit side effects that we know about, explicit error handling, and reusability resulting from this style. And as some of you might have seen, all of this and more can be found in our book, which is called Das Currybuch. Um, I'm not sure how many German speakers are in this audience. The book is in German for now. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> but the code examples are in English, though, so you can ease into it via a known language again. So we have seen it's fun and totally possible to explore deeper functional concepts in JavaScript. It's all there. And even though I still like Haskell, I'm amazed about how much elegance this programming style reveals from the core of JavaScript. I think it's just awesome. And refactoring in the functional style is really fun. Thank you for listening.